Hello everybody. Today we'll be talking about wildlife management as the last topic in our natural resources class. So for our objectives for this lecture, the first thing we're going to focus on is uh, the three basic um, wildlife principles or the three-legged stool model is uh, what we'll refer to it in terms of um, we want to be able to understand the habitat want to be able to understand the wildlife itself and also want to be under, be able to understand people and people's relationship to wildlife and how they how they view it and how that came to be because in terms of wildlife management um it really is this interaction that we have with the with wildlife um which is a little different from other parts of the ecosystem um we don't really think about it with trees um and with the soil and with the water and these other parts because they don't um they don't move they don't they don't uh really interact with us they're just kind of there whereas wildlife um can can just be a part of our lives whether it's um somebody who lives near the woods and has deer come into their their backyard every day or the idea of wanting to go to a national park to go see a grizzly bear or the idea of i just i want to go um uh out into the ocean and and see see whales or um you know some even some of the scary stuff like i'm gonna go out surfing and what was that that just bumped my leg um we we have these interactions with wildlife which means that um we really there's a there's a different component to wildlife than there is to the other parts of um natural resources and then uh towards the at the very end of the lecture there's a great video that I want to show you about um, just really in my mind it's uh, about how how natural resources can uh, and and thinking about natural resources and specifically wildlife management in this instance can really um, be beneficial and be something that's that's a part of a community and so let's kind of start off uh, with the basics and really understand, um, start to understand these these three pieces of this uh, of this model. So let's start off at the very beginning. If we're talking about uh, wildlife management, what is it we're talking about? And so uh, if you were to look it up in a textbook, you might see something like plan use protection and control of wildlife by the application of ecological principles, which uh, makes sense. There's, um, it's a little simplistic, and um, I think we can improve upon it. So um, I would, I would, or I prefer the um, the definition of wildlife management more to be the art and science of making decisions and taking actions to manipulate habitat, wildlife, and people to achieve human goals. Because that's um, one thing that's really interesting is is that it it is human goals because we have established ourselves as um as the the top species on this planet so um when we look at wildlife we're looking at it as how is it going to affect us and we do want we do want the ecosystem to be healthy we do want wildlife to be happy and healthy and successful but it is it still has this human element to it because it's how how are they going to fit into our life on this planet and it's in one in one way that that makes it uh, it's a little bit difficult because it's um it's almost like you you have to really decide how do you view wildlife and how important is it to you and that's why it's a it says to achieve human goals because when we think about this we don't just say well um you know let's just set this up for the wildlife and they'll be fine you know if somebody goes over there and you know like they get eaten by a by a bear you know so be it that's not that's never been the approach that that has been successful it's always how does how is this interaction going to work how is this going to play um play where we come together with the wildlife and so it is about achieving human goals but those human goals hopefully will um, focus on um, on making sure that the ecosystem is healthy making sure that the wildlife are happy healthy and sustainable and that people understand how to 
interact with wildlife in a proper and safe manner. So when it comes down to our principles of wildlife management, we're really going to focus on this three-legged stool model. This idea of the habitat that the animals are going to need, the animals themselves, and then the people that are and how those people are going to uh, interact uh, with the animals in that habitat. And you have to have all three of these to really be able to achieve your human goals. So here's our simple model. And um, usually we think about the earth, we think about us, it makes sense, but then you bring in the critters. And when you bring in wildlife, sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. This beaver, it's a, it's a keystone species. We've talked about that before. We know um, the importance of it, but that doesn't mean that that beaver can't simply chew that habitat leg up and cause a problem and then what are we going to do about it? Is, is it a problem? Is it something that we just say that's what it does? How do we figure out things like that? And that's, that's kind of the idea of wildlife management. How are we going to incorporate these three things when they, when, you know, some of them might seem at odds. So I think the easiest one to start out with is the animals themselves, the wildlife. So as our uh, pocket gopher right here in the background, uh, he seems excited to get going. So let's kind of dig in. So what is wildlife? How are we going to, how are we going to define wildlife? Wildlife is um, undomestic, undomesticated terrestrial vertebrates. That's what we're talking about. So birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians. Um, you can throw in uh, invertebrates in there if you want to, but really wildlife, when you're talking about wildlife, it focuses much more on undomesticated terrestrial vertebrates. So we have three different classifications for wildlife. Um, and since, uh, going back to our definition where we think about it's the idea of achieving human goals, uh, that's, that's where kind of these classifications start. So you have game animals, game animals are the ones that you're trying to hunt. So they can, they can be harvested and are, and defined by, by law and by regulations. You can have big game or large game. You can have small game. You can have waterfowl. You can have upland game birds. So. If you have waterfowl, those are um, um, birds that are in the water that get hunted. Whereas if you have upland game birds, you're talking about um, birds on the land. Um, prairie chickens, sage grouse, um, turkeys, those sorts of things qualify as uh, upland game birds. And then also fur bearers that get trapped. Uh, you have non-game animals, so animals that you're not looking to harvest. Uh, songbirds and salamanders are some easy examples of that. With our game animals, I didn't give you any examples. Uh, elk, moose, uh, deer, bear, uh, all sorts of small game, um, raccoons, beavers. It, um, some of those could fall under non-game. Some of those could fall under game. And some of them could fall into this third category of nuisance or pest. It really depends on on um, your human goals and what what is it you're trying to achieve so uh, nuisance or pest killed but not for recreation usually for economics so things like beavers could be seen as a pest things uh, like raccoons can be seen as a pest um, ants could even be seen as a pest it really uh, it depends on on what it is you're trying to achieve uh, with your human goals and what, how, how are they looked at um, in terms of being, being a pest. When we talk about wildlife, there's five important um, items or five important categories, five important things that are really needed um, for wildlife to, to function in a sustainable manner. And those five are food, cover, space, water, and then um, the ability to reproduce or um, have reproductive capability that is um, uninhibited. So let's go into each one of those. So for the first one, for food, there's three basic foraging strategies uh, that animals have. 
One is to be a generalist, so you're going to consume a great variety of foods. Um, the, the fancy term for this would be uh, uriophagus, and so it's going to it's going to eat lots of different things. A raccoon's a great example of this. Um, I think um, maybe some of you have heard uh, heard it called other other names like a trash panda. Um, and I think that name's kind of funny, but it, it speaks to this generalist idea of, it, you know, a raccoon is perfectly um, fine going through the trash and eating different pieces of whatever's in there. That speaks much more to this generalist um, foraging strategy. A specialist uh, forager is, some, is, an, is an animal that's going to consume very few and specific foods. Uh, stenophages would be the... the um, more correct term for this a panda bear would be a great example of that uh, panda bear only eats bamboo so a panda bear has to live in a very specific region and doesn't really it can't really move anywhere else uh, can't really um, do anything else because it, it relies on that one food source and so without that one food source it um, it becomes uh, problematic for that species. So specialists have a very hard time uh, if their habitat is not um, not well set up for them. And then there's coprophages. Um, so these are animals that don't get enough nutrients the first time around, so they actually eat their own feces to get the nutrients a second time. And if you're like me, you say, well, that seems uh, kind of interesting. So let's talk about it a little bit more. Rabbits are a great example of copro coprophagous species. Um, so, it's uh, coprophagy is the consumption of feces by animals. Uh, rabbits don't have a complex ruminant digestive system like some animals do. So, um, they need to extract excess amounts of nutrients from grass by giving their food a second pass through the gut. So that so they end up making these soft fecal pellets, which are just partially digested food, and then they go back and eat that partially digested food, and then that will give them the adequate nutrition to be able to make it through the day. So it's it's a it's an adaptation to the idea that their their digestive system doesn't do enough the first time around to make sure they get the the nutrients that they need. So they actually basically poop out partially digested food and then go after it again. In terms of the food itself, we're going to classify food for wildlife in three ways. We're going to have preferred, we're going to have staple, and we're going to have uh, emergency. And so with preferred, those are going to be um, foods that are more abundant in in the, the diet of the wildlife species than their abundance in the field. So this is the stuff, this is the, the food that's like uh, candy to, uh, to the, uh, the animal. This is, this is the, the junk food. This is the stuff that you're going to see. Um, this, is, this is the stuff that they want to eat. It's usually not things that you see a lot in the field because it's the preferred things. So we talked about this before in the range management section as decreaser species. These are the species that the animals really like. So you're not going to actually see them a lot because as soon as they're out there, some animals probably trying to eat it. Your staple foods are what's going to make up the majority of their of the of the animal's diet um, because it's going to meet their nutritional needs. It's not what they prefer to eat, but it's what they're going to eat because they need to. Uh, sustain a certain level of nutrition and uh, its abundance out in the field will make it um, something that they can regularly go to. So for instance, um, you might see uh, like um, elk or deer, they prefer um, really soft leaves and new growth on um, young trees or shrubs. So you'll see that as some preferred food, but as a staple, you'll see them eating grass or um, older parts of the trees or things like that just because they need to meet their nutritional requirements and maybe their preferred food isn't available. And then there's also going to be a category of emergency foods. So foods that meet short-term nutri nutritional needs only eaten uh, 
in the absence of the staple and the preferred foods. And these foods usually offer low nutritional value and they cannot sustain the animal. So the, an animal cannot live off of emergency foods. It needs to have the staple that meets its nutritional needs. So it's only eating this stuff because it has to. And the way I've, uh, I've kind of mentioned this to students before, uh, a way to think about it is the idea of that day when uh, you don't have any money to go to the store and you're running really low and you just look at your fridge and you see this thing in the back of the fridge and you're not sure like how long it's been there or uh, when you made it or if it's still going to be good for you but you really have no other choice so you're going to eat it and that's that's what we think about with the emergency you know it's not the box of mac and cheese that I go to all the time or it's not um my uh usual meal that I have available to me at all times or it's not the um five course meal at the fancy restaurant that I get to go to every once in a while it's just that thing that I have to eat right now because that's my only choice Another um, another important idea uh, when it comes to wildlife is the idea of cover. So the idea of protection, the idea of being able to hide and um, really give uh, a wildlife species a sense of uh, a sense of relaxation, a place that they can a, a shelter, um, a home, some sort of a, a respite from both the environment and um, other species because we've talked about the idea of competition and how species are are constantly in competition and the whole world revolves around competition and so having some cover gives you gives you a place to rest gives you a place to avoid harassment avoid weather avoid environmental issues and avoid, avoid competitors raise um, raise a family a place where you really the animal feels comfortable and so that's a really important idea um, in terms of species survival. Space. When we're talking about the idea of space, there's a couple um, big ideas we want to discuss. We want to discuss uh, home range and we want to discuss territory. So the first one we're going to focus on is home range. The home range is the amount of space an animal uses on a regular basis. That's what's called its home range. So in this diagram on the right, uh, we see our hawk here. And we see that um, this larger circle is within its home range. We have its habitat, the place where it's suited to live. And we have different food patches that it's going to go, um, places where it's going to go feed. But, the, um, but its home range where it goes to meet all of its daily requirements daily and seasonal requirements is is that whole square and so when you look at the um, little uh, songbird down below in comparison you can see that we went from this big huge eight kilometer track now down to this um, two zero point two kilometer track so a much much smaller area and that that where it's perfectly fine finding its habitat and its food and um, having a much smaller home range because it's a much it's smaller animal so it doesn't need to go as far and you start thinking about the way that um, some of these animals are shaped and the size of these animals and you start to realize that part of that is because of their home range so why is a hawk big and then why is an eagle bigger than a hawk and why is a vulture um, even have a have a bigger wingspan and why does one fly higher than the other and because of the, what they're trying to look for and how big their home range is but this is the same it's not only just in birds but it's in all all animals and all wildlife where they where they need to go to be able to do all their things so even uh, to think about um, some people who have uh, like a cat as a pet but they leave it as an outdoor cat I think people would be really surprised at the idea of um, how far how far that is and um, where that cat goes to meet all of its daily requirements if you were able to put a little GPS 
collar on your cat? How far would it actually go away from your house? Would it be really close by and just be hanging out in the yard? Or would it ha spread out um, for huge distances? Um, one species uh, that has a huge home range is a uh, mountain lion. Mountain lions cover miles on a daily basis and they have a very huge home range. Uh, in comparison to a home range, um, you have the word territory. Now, a territory is a defended area. It's a specific um, area where a certain part, species is going to try and keep out uh, either other species or even members of the same species from that specific area. So this uh, figure on the right, this example I have, so it says, in spring, male barrows golden eyes defend their territories on the open water where they spend most of their time during the nesting season. The boundaries are like invisible lines on the water surface and are defended by aggressive displays or attacks, sometimes underwater. Um, offshore territories are smaller because they are less defendable and are usually abandoned early. So they, they'll have a bigger territory out on the water. And so you can kind of see some of the birds are not as uh, territorial, so they'll hang out in a flock. But the other ones, they have their specific territory where if any of the other species, whether it's another species or even the same species, so interspecific or intraspecific competition, they're going to defend their area. So a home range and a territory, two different versions of how animals use space, but not definitely not the same thing. Water, water becomes extremely important out here in the western United States because of how dry it is and the lack of precipitation. Um, fencing can sometimes be used as a water management tool uh, and fencing out um, larger animals like livestock, um, trying to protect water quality, um, protect stream banks from erosion. And um, there's all sorts of different ways um, that water can be protected, but water is a, is a really limiting uh, resource out west. Not so much back east because of the humidity, because of the um, amount of precipitation. It's uh, much more common for water to be a, a limiting factor out in the western United States. And that gets us to our example of the gallinaceous guzzler. So the picture we just saw of the of the quail before. Um, this figure on the right here is the idea of what they were popping out of, which is this um, this store, water storage area that allows for the, um, the birds to get in, but not any other uh, species that might try and uh, compete with the birds or, or be able to take water from them. Um, this is common in the western U.S. to try and enhance uh, some of this dry land habitat where there's not a lot of water available. And if you want to see more and see kind of how it works, I've attached a video down here on the right where it says uh, Western U.S. So make sure if you're following along with the PDF slides, you pause the video right here and take a look at that, at that video. And then reproduction is one of our other uh, five things necessary for wildlife. And the big thing is species persistence. We want to make sure that, um, like we've talked about with our other um, aspects of natural resources, that we're focused on sustainability. We want to make sure that these species are, are around uh, to be enjoyed for future generations. Plus, we understand their importance to the ecosystem and um, the idea of that without certain species that, that ecosystems could fall apart. And so um, one of the big things that uh, could be problematic to reproduction is the idea of habitat um, disconnection or fragmentation. And so habitat connectivity becomes something important that we want to focus on. Fragmentation can be extremely problematic um, for species when they're in, um, in thinking about this idea of habitat connectivity. Um, the idea that um, that the habitat can be broken up in some way and that the idea that um, animals can be cut off from their normal patterns. Um, all species are, are creatures of habit and get used to certain things and um, it becomes 
difficult for a species to really figure out how to how to adapt to that. Um, just think about um, something as simply as um, when you have your normal route that you go to school or that you go to work and then all of a sudden there's construction and they tell you to take a detour and um, how how difficult that seems in your mind even though it might be kind of a simplistic thing you're you you don't like that that adaption to change and for for some species that adaption to change is too hard or too difficult to overcome and so it really becomes uh important to think about ha habitat connectivity and how the ecosystem works and really to understand an animal's home range and where they need to go to meet their daily and seasonal requirements and how large that area may be to think about how when we come into the area with the wildlife how do we interact with them in a positive way and how do we get our community uh, in there in a positive way that we're not going to negatively affect these species when it comes to reproduction because the idea of a sustainable population of species really comes down um, to this idea of, of reproductive capability and making sure that they're um, they're happy and healthy and um, that they have a good habitat quality to where um, to where they don't feel um, stress or they don't feel um, or they don't have any problems to where uh, their reproductive capability may be um, threatened or um, problematic. So we have three um, types of animal movements as well in just kind of going over these basic principles of wildlife. Um, the three of them, the first one um, is dispersal of young. We're not going to um, focus on that one too much because it's the um, the idea is decently simplistic. Just the idea that uh, an, a species will have um, young and then the young will uh, leave the nest or leave the um uh, clutch or leave the the area in which it was born and then disperse to another area. Um, the two other areas we're going to focus on a little bit more are mass immigration, which is a very rare event, and then migration, which is a pretty common event for a lot of animals. So with mass immigration, uh, we're going to use the snowy owl as an example. Um, the snowy owl, 90% of the food is lemmings and um, they had a food shortage. So the big idea with, with a mass immigration is that there's gotta be some sort of event, some sort of um, problem or disturbance that really causes the, uh, the animal to leave the habitat and leave the habitat in large numbers. And so this food shortage um, from intense competition because they had too many birds caused them to find a different habitat and move out to to different habitats. So they moved from the normal uh, winter Arctic habitats to southern regions in search of food. And if you click down below where it says CBS, it, um, it's a news clip that, that talks about um, this event that happened in winter of 2011, 2012. Um, these rare events are called eruptions and um, the, the animal can go um, back to its original habitat um, but it's not a normal event to have a mass immigration. It's a very rare event for wildlife. A much more normal event um, for wildlife is the idea of migration. Though. And migration is defined as the regular and predictable exit from and return to portions of their home range. And so uh, we see this a lot. Um, people think about it all the time with the idea of uh, birds flying south for the winter. Um, but that's that's one form of migration. There's actually three forms of migration. There's altitudinal, latitudinal, and nomadic. Um, the latitudinal, that's the one we're familiar with, the idea of birds flying south for the winter. Um, another one that we're actually familiar with that you may not think about is the idea of um, nomadic migration. So the idea of um, how bison, and how we talked about in this, in this in the past, how bison roamed all the way from Canada to Mexico, to um, the eastern United States, and they had that area, that large area where they would eat some grass, and then they would move on to the next area, eat up the grass, and then move on to the next area. And we also see this among um, African grazing animals, as well as the same kind of nomadic idea. The one we might not be um, as familiar with is the idea of altitudinal. So um, elk are a good example of this, that during um, the winter, 
Um, they're going to move down uh, to the lower elevations. Um, we'll see them sometimes down in the valleys um, when it's uh, when it's a little bit um, colder. And then as it starts to heat back up, because of the way that they're uh, they are biologically made, um, that that heat's not as good. The forage isn't going to be as avail as available, so they're going to go uh, move back up to the higher elevations. So then what forces them to go back down to the valley? Well, the idea that um, sometimes these higher elevations will get snow covered or their food won't be as available. So they'll go back down to the valley or the lower elevations where there's more food available. So that's altitudinal migration. So we've got altitudinal, latitudinal, and nomadic migrations. And then we've talked about this idea earlier, but let's reemphasize it again. The idea of a keystone species. In, in wildlife. So an organism on which other species in an ecosystem largely depend such that if it were removed, the ecosystem would change drastically. And um, the one example we have talked about before was the, was the American beaver. And then also talked about the idea of the, the mountain lion being removed from, or sorry, the uh, wolves being removed from Yellowstone and the idea of, of an apex predator being removed from um, from a uh, an area to where the habitat then um, or and the ecosystem becomes in flux and um, breaks down because of the lack of a, of a level of trophic structure needed in that area. Um, so there are three types of keystone species. Um, the first two we've given you examples of. So a predator, uh, the gray wolf in Yellowstone, um, sharks in the ocean would be another example of a, a keystone predator species. The ecosystem engineer, our American beaver, is a great example of that one. The idea that um, because of what they do to the ecosystem and creating the dams and um, creating a water source for other animals, how that becomes important in terms of an ecosystem. And then there's also uh, mutualist keystone species. So when two or more species in an ecosystem interact for each other's uh, benefit. Um, a good example of a mutualist keystone species would be bees, because people uh, lately have been a, a made a, um, made a made it important for people to understand um, what would happen if the bees disappeared? Because the flowers um, need the bees uh, for pollination. So what happens if the bees aren't there to pollinate the flowers? And then how does that affect the rest of the ecosystem if that pollination doesn't occur? And so those are, those are some examples of keystone species. One of my favorite examples of a keystone species as a kid who grew up in California and grew up going to the Monterey Bay Aquarium all the time is the idea of the sea otter. So the sea otter keeps animals such as urchins, abalone, and mussels that eat the kelp forest in check. So even though sea otters have predators, uh, sharks in the ocean, the health of the ecosystem still depends on the sea otter. Uh, so uh, it's just, it's interesting how it all ties together and it really, um, even this sea otter example to me really ties together the idea of um, how complex an ecosystem an ecosystem can be and how fragile an ecosystem can be as well. And that's part one of our lecture. Um, head over to part two, where we'll continue to talk about the other two parts of the of the three-legged model: the habitat and the people.